I've represented abuse survivors for 20 years, but these are some of the most horrifying and extreme and violent and appalling cases that I've dealt with. What really happened here was that young women tried to go to social services for help. They tried to get support in terms of getting out of this situation. Social services completely misunderstood what was going on. They, they, they thought, and it's portrayed very well in the film, um, that these young women, young girls, were making so-called lifestyle choices, that they were choosing to be exploited in this way. The reality, of course, was that these young girls were subject to very extreme violence and threats of violence and were in a situation where they needed the support of social services and the police to get out of this. So there were clearly serious failings by the agencies involved here, serious failings by social services and some failings by the police as well. We sought to get accountability for that. Uh, we sought to make sure that the young women were properly compensated and that they were able to rebuild their lives. The grooming and abuse of teenage girls has finally ended. Rape and trafficking. The victims were girls aged just 13 to 15. These men said the victims chosen by these defendants, quote, were chosen because they were not of your community. I remember vividly the day the verdicts came in and I remember sitting in my front room on my own watching Steve Haywood walk out onto the steps at Liverpool Crown Court and give a statement on behalf of Greater Manchester Police. Okay. Um, this has been a fantastic result for British justice. These victims have been through the most horrendous of crimes and I just want to commend their bravery in relation to the ordeal they've had to go through. These are the most vulnerable in our society and they have been preyed upon by adults who should know better. There were so many feelings going through me when I saw him on those steps and it, it crystallised everything I was feeling about the whole on-street grooming. I would also like to thank my officers for the profession... He had been in charge of child protection at the time of Operation Augusta. He was the man I had face-to-face -face meetings with. He knew full well what on-street grooming was. You saw Victoria's photograph. You saw her letter. You knew that Operation Augusta was a live and running job. You knew what the offender profile was. You read my report. You were part of the officers who authorised it to go to the major incident team. And you were one of the ones who dropped that job. Thank you very much. You are is a statement by the police that they believe there may be dozens more victims in this particular case. That day, the news media were covering it 24-7. This is the most striking front page, a nation shame. You know, I have not known anything like it in my life. A horrendous case under the there was real shock at uh, what this case had uncovered. There was a sense of how, where is it, where else is it happening? How many other perpetrators are there? How much abuse is going on? Why is this happening? What's our responsibility? This is about power, and it's about sexual exploitation. All but one of the men was from Pakistan. The ninth was from Afghanistan. Right? I had hoped that I would get on board comrades in the Labour Party, and many were. Many were genuinely sympathetic. Uh, to what I was talking about and uh, supporting me in every way. Uh, but there was a small number who uh, either uh, very openly or perhaps whisper, whisper, you know, sort of were saying things that uh, uh, perhaps I was something of a racist. And that was very upsetting. I'm absolutely convinced it was a, a political correctitude gone mad. Uh, you know, th there was absolutely no reason for it. I was rocking the multicultural boat, but how do you get changes without talking about it? No, definitely not. When I left Greater Manchester, we had a, one operation with more than 200 suspects. And having my national responsibilities, I knew that there were thousands of suspects around the country and thousands of victims. So this is, as somebody said in your piece, the tip of the iceberg. Victims are coming out all over the country and offenders are being caught all over the country. Well, the vast majority of child sex abuse offenders across the country are British white men. Uh, in this Rotherham scandal, the National Crime Agency says that the majority of suspects, and I quote, are of Asian appearance. What do you make of that? 
um, I've, I've, I gave evidence to Parliament about this some years ago. The reality is that where you have uh, street grooming of the type that we're talking about in Rotherham, as we did in Rochdale and Oxford and other parts of the country, Asians and Pakistanis are disproportionately involved in this. I've tried to understand it myself by looking at the demography, looking at the nighttime economy, uh, and I've asked for several people to carry out some research and correlations into what's happening. The reality is, though, that in, in street grooming, Asians are disproportionately involved. And, uh, and that's an issue not just for the authorities, it's an issue for the communities. So you'd agree with you know, what seems on the face of it a pretty bold statement by uh, Sarah Champion, the local MP, the Rotherham MP. She says there's very clearly a problem in Rotherham with Pakistani males. We need to deal with that head on and ethnicity should have no bearing on the law. Do you absolutely agree right. That? Sarah is absolutely right. Um, the, the law should be blind to colour and ethnicity and religion. The reality is these men aren't driven by their ethnicity or their religion or their colour. They're driven by the fact that they want power and control over young girls. The fact is, however, when it comes to street grooming, Asians are disproportionately involved. But as you said, the most child victims are victims in the home or institutions or, on the, or, or in online. And they, they will be perpet the perpetrators there will be white males. But... Let's say it again, Asians and Pakistani men are disproportionately involved in street grooming. And as a British Pakistani Muslim yourself, are you worried about taking such a robust stance on this? No, I brought the Rostra prosecution. I led nationally on these prosecutions. Uh, it's absolutely essential that the Muslim community, the Pakistani community, carry their own stick and deal with these issues. These perpetrators have been allowed to get away with it for far too long, sadly, and victims have suffered for far too long. And my point is that justice delayed is better than justice denied. And when you hear the NCA say that uh, two under investigation are serving all former councillors, we know that there are allegations against police officers as well, how confident can you be that there's not going to be another establishment cover-up as we've seen in so many other uh, investigations in the past? Well, I'm optimistic, uh, Cathy, because things have changed over the last three, four years. Historically, yes, there probably have been conspiracies. There certainly have been cover-ups. The reality is, though, that the NCA, all the specialist officers, specialist prosecutors, are determined to bring people to justice now. And I'm confident that they will do their job. But it's absolutely essential they provide support to the victims here because too many of them have never had any faith in the authorities. They now need to be given that support through this trial process, through the prosecution process. They were here at the beginning and they turned up for the end of a trial that was often shocking and never short of controversy. The police had said that race wasn't relevant. It certainly became an issue. Sentencing the eight British Pakistanis and one Afghan man, the judge said that the victims had been treated as though they were worthless. One of the factors leading to that was the fact, he said, that they were not part of your community or religion. The court had been told that the gang of men had preyed on white girls in the Lancashire town of Haywood, in some cases raping them, in the words of the judge, callously, viciously and violently. Not a question of race, according to Greater Manchester Police, but simply criminality. Among those who asked whether political correctness may have played a part in the police approach to the case was the education secretary. I don't think that political correctness should get in the way. That's why I am pleased that the Office of Children's Commissioner is conducting an inquiry into every aspect of child sexual exploitation by groups and gangs. And they're asking some tough questions about the cultural background of some of these criminals. A recent study into on-street grooming found that of 753 offenders, nearly half were of Asian heritage. The police point out that 95% of those on the sex offenders register in Greater Manchester are white. But a group representing young British Muslims say that of 68 recent convictions involving child exploitation, 59 offenders were British Pakistani men. It is a race issue. Let's be clear about that. These are Asian gangs, these are Asian men, these are Asian criminals, particularly of Pakistani origin and the victims are, are, are nine out of ten times white. So it is a race issue. A tweet posted by British National Party leader Nick Griffin, apparently revealing verdicts before the jury had delivered them to the court, has led one lawyer to lodge an appeal. In the circumstances we submit, the impartiality and independence of the jury, which is a cornerstone of any fair trial, may have been compromised.
While the town of Haywood tries to wipe away the stain of this case, its implications are likely to reverberate for months to come. It is still going on, grooming, rape and sex abuse in Rochdale and beyond. Today's report merely deals with the recent past. Six children raped and exploited by a gang of men for five years. Yet 17 different agencies, including the police and social services, failed completely to give them sufficient help. Today's report says much of it could have been prevented. The review was prompted by the conviction of nine men last year, but police now admit that up to 30 other suspects were never prosecuted at all. This report by Cordelia Lynch begins with the testimony of one victim voiced by an actor. I was 13 years old and passed between them like a bomb. I suffered rape and threats of violence. What made things worse for me was the attitude of the police. I told them about what was happening. I gave them names, phone numbers and car registrations. I told them about a man who made threats to kill me. The men were not arrested and I still sometimes see them walking the streets of Rochdale. This terrifies me. She continues to suffer one of the many victims of a grooming gang in Rochdale that was allowed to thrive by a police force that failed to listen or act. Last year, nine men, mostly of Pakistani origin, were convicted of abusing the vulnerable girls, plying them with alcohol and cigarettes. But there are many more who were reported by the girls and their families, but were not investigated. Much of the abuse happened here in Hayward, and now, more than 18 months down the line, we have two reports into two separate cases with one central question. How could it be that young, vulnerable girls could report years of systematic sexual abuse and yet the agencies who are meant to be protecting them failed to stop it? 17, including NHS trusts and social services, missed countless opportunities. Some of the girls were as young as 12, but officers from Greater Manchester Police suggested their decision to be with the men, some in their 50s, was a lifestyle choice. And when one girl fell pregnant, they obtained the aborted fetus for evidence without her permission. It was only years later, when they gained my trust under false pretenses, that they told me they had kept the fetus and wanted to use it in evidence. Sir Peter Fahey was Chief Constable in 2008. Today's report states his detectives were untrained and failed to report allegations of rape as crimes. When you read through the way that those officers behaved in this case, are you ashamed? No, I'm not. I'm not ashamed because um, I think it is very easy to blame individual police officers. I've got a lot of sympathy for officers that are working with the system. I remember in those days going to Rochdale CID, sitting next to police officers who absolutely believe their victim. Um, but had, had found inconsistencies in the story, had found that the, you know, the victim had previous convictions, drug issues, alcohol issues, and already knew that when they put the case through to the Crown Prosecution Service or tried to get into court, that the case would not be taken forward. But today the force is criticised for failing to challenge that decision by the Crown Prosecution Service not to prosecute. Prior to this case, a view was taken that the case couldn't be built on the credibility of a young girl who had a troubled or a chaotic background. We took the decision in 2011 to bring this prosecution, uh, to successfully prosecute it, and therefore why can't it be done everywhere? This case review reads like so many others before it, a woeful tale of miscommunication, agencies failing to talk to each other and critically to listen to the victims and their families. In one case, a father was so concerned, he called social services and the police 50 times, only to be told by one social worker that his daughter was a child prostitute. I've got files like that. Maggie Oliver worked on the case, but resigned last year over the way police treated victims. She spoke exclusively to Channel 4 News. two years of my life. When I read a report that focuses on 2008, and I'm told that we've learned lessons from this and things are so much better now. Well, I have got evidence to say that in 2011, things were no better in 2012. Who do you think should be held accountable? I guess the Chief Constable. My audit trail went right through to the Chief Constable. I documented in writing all my concerns and I backed up what I was saying with uh, documentary evidence. Jonathan Bridge is the lawyer for three of the victims. I think even in the Rochdale case, you will be looking at hundreds potentially still out there preying on victims. 
One of my clients who was abused in Rochdale also reports abuse in seven or eight other towns across the northwest and even down as far as, as Wolverhampton in the Midlands. And this was a, a feature of this type of abuse that not only were the girls abused in a specific town, but they would be passed between gangs in other towns. And unfortunately, I think Rochdale is just the tip of an iceberg. The Independent Police Complaints Commission are due to publish a report into Rochdale, but the girls, now troubled young women, have already lost all faith in the force. The abuse I suffered at the hands of the gang has made a massive impact on my life, but it's been made so much worse by the police. I feel so let down by them and feel what has happened to me could have been prevented had they acted more quickly. Rafiq is the chief executive of the Ramadan Foundation. He joins us now live from Manchester. Thanks for being with us, sir. Both the Good police afternoon. and the judge in this case appear to believe that uh, the race of the victims and abusers was coincidental. Do you agree? Well, what the judge also said, he felt that the uh, girls, uh, that these culprits, these evil men, thought that these girls were worthless. They're the same terms that I've been using uh, for the last 48 hours. Let's be very clear. Uh, if you look at the figures uh, that you were ref your report was referring to, out of 77 recent convictions, 67 are British Pakistani men. We've got a problem amongst our community where there are those people who are involved in grooming feel that uh, Asian, uh, sorry, feel that white girls are less valuable than their own daughters, and they think they're worthless. And I think that's abhorrent. It's wrong. We've got to take it on, and that's what we've been doing over the last 24 hours. So, what is your message to the British Pakistani community? We can't bury our head in the sand no longer. If we don't deal with this now, then tomorrow it will be our daughters and our sisters. And let's be clear, there's no difference between my daughters and my sisters and the people who've been uh, groomed in this way. It's very important as a community we do that. And actually, Adrian, over the last... Um, 12 months or so, I've been inundated uh, with a, a huge level of support from young British Pakistani people who are absolutely disgusted about what happens, but very clear that we will not allow the far right and EDL and the British National Party and other far right organisations to come into our communities and try to divide us on this particular issue. Uh, the police have been accused of failing to act in this case, as we were hearing, for fear of being uh, accused of, uh, of racism. What, what's your response to that? Well, I think there were serious questions about the conduct of Greater Manchester Police and the Crown Prosecution Service. One, one of these girls who are uh, victims went to the police in 2008. She was told by the Crown Prosecution Service she was no longer a credible witness and she was sent back into an environment of abuse. And so there is, there's been an abject failure of the system in this country to protect young girls. And we must not allow that to happen again. And Greater Manchester Police uh, must uh, be very open and honest about dealing with this issue and should, there should be no sensitivity whatsoever about race. I say that as a British Pakistani uh, who abhors what has right. happened, disgusted by it, and believe okay. there should be no safe hiding place in our community for these right. people. You say there should be no sensitivity, but is political correctness, do you think, holding back any attempts to properly assess the role that race plays in exploitation crimes, uh, not just among the Pakistani community, but across all cultures and ethnicities in the UK? Well, I think what the problem is, when you see the British National Party and other far-right organisations like the English Defence League demonstrating and, and whipping up hatred on this particular issue, then there are those in the police and local authorities in this country who feel they don't want to be part on the same line, on the same side as, as them. And I think that's a wrong attitude to have. We must confront this. This is criminality. This is uh, people who think they can uh, abuse girls in this way. It's child abuse. Uh, and we must, uh, we must uh, not stop... Uh, in protecting our children. Thank you, sir. Mohammed Shafiq there Thank you. in Manchester. The trial has begun of 11 men accused of sexually abusing girls as young as 13 after plying them with drink and drugs. The prosecution claimed they acted together to exploit the girls in the Rochdale area. The men in the dock deny a series of charges, including rape and trafficking. Claire Fallon has been at today's hearing. Even before it started, this case attracted hundreds of protesters. With 11 men on trial, most of them taxi drivers and takeaway workers. Some face rape charges, others are accused of sex trafficking. It's claimed they were all part of a gang which conspired to lure underage girls into sexual activity. Opening the case against the 11 men, prosecutor Rachel Smith told the jury they might find some of it distressing. She said the events and circumstances described by the girls are at best saddening and at worst shocking. No child should be exploited as these girls say they were. 
It's claimed the abuse often started at two takeaways in Haywood, Tasty Bites and the Balti House. They are now in the hands of different owners. At the time, two of the defendants worked there, Kabir Hassan and a man who can't be identified. The court heard girls were invited into the takeaways and given free food and vodka. Before long, it's claimed some of them were being raped, forced to have sex in the backs of taxis and being driven around to houses across the northwest where the prosecution says they were passed around among numerous men. Outlining the abuse, it's claimed one girl suffered. The jury was told she did not always cry or protest, although she often did both. She was having sex with several men in a day, several times a week. Two of the men on trial are accused of raping her, four face charges of trafficking her for sex. The court also heard another alleged victim was only 13 when one of the defendants got her pregnant. Much of the detail the jury's been given is too graphic for us to report. But they were also told about a 15-year-old who says she was often given so much alcohol she'd be near unconscious. It's claimed she'd sometimes wake up while men were abusing her. That teenager was in care at the time. The prosecution told the court she had lost count of the number of times she had sex with men she did not want to. Five of the defendants are accused of raping her. Two of them are also accused of trafficking her. Another is charged with sexual assault. Although there are 11 men on trial here, the prosecution claims the girls were also abused by others who've not yet been identified. All those in the dock deny the charges against them and the child's expected to last around 11 weeks. Claire Pallon, young good girls are thought to have been abused across Rochdale. So far, just nine men have been jailed for crimes including rape, trafficking and sexual activity with a child. Now, three years after those convictions, Greater Manchester Police has apologised for letting victims down. Today, the head of the force told me officers should have done more. You admit police failed in Rochdale. What do you want to say to the victims? We want to apologise to the victims for the failures and the fact that there were delays in the system, which meant you know, it took us too long to get these cases to court. Yes, they made mistakes, there were misjudgments. Senior officers in particular should have asked for more help from some of our specialist departments. Uh, but ultimately, as I say, they were also working in a system that had those weaknesses. A review into how police dealt with victims found they failed to properly investigate claims of abuse. It also found officers were distracted by other crimes, such as achieving targets on burglary. And it said there was a complete lack of understanding of child exploitation. Two of the victims are now planning to sue police, but this lawyer who represents 20 of the victims says compensation will only go so far. What victims want to see more than anything is real cultural change in the various agencies involved in this, whether it's social services, whether it's police, whether it's the court system, so that we can prevent these kind of tragedies in the future and we can make sure that perpetrators are effectively prosecuted and that these events don't repeat in the future. The girls abused in Rochdale were subjected to grooming by a network of men. Yet in spite of today's apology, no action will be taken against any officer from Greater Manchester Police and many of the victims will be left feeling that the system has let them down again. Hey, Hayes. Welcome back this morning. Last year, um, nine men were given jail sentences of up to 19 years for their part in a child sexual exploitation gang. Well, the court heard that five girls, the youngest of whom was just 13 when her abuse began, were plied with alcohol and drugs as they were groomed to be passed around groups of men for sex. Well, we recently spoke with one of those girls after she'd been a key witness in the trial and her story may shock you. To protect her anonymity, all names were changed for the purpose of this interview. Thank you for coming in today. Uh, this is, a, I know, a very big step for you. Um, and let's go back to June 2008 and there's a group of girls, you're 15 years old, and there's a group of girls who just hang around together. Um, what, what did you do? What was it like? Um, well, it started off, um, they invited me to come to the takeaway with them because um, they'd been going. Um, so I went up one night and um, they just bought us um, alcohol. So what, that, sort of, what sort of people were at the takeaway? These, these a, a group of men? Yeah, um, the Asian men who worked there. How many people do you think? There was, there was just three who worked there. Um, 
So they became sort of friends to begin with, and they invited you and the rest of the girls to come out, to come upstairs and to just chill out. Yeah, um, I, was, I thought it was a bit strange, but um, I was getting all this free stuff. And what, what made you trust them? Um, I think I just didn't think anything like that really happened. And at this time in your own life, your home life with your parents was breaking down. There was constant arguments about you going out, drinking, coming back late, and this led to you to actually moving out. Yeah, um, I went to stay with um, some friends from school. Mm. Um, I just ended up moving in there, really. Yeah. And what was this house like that you moved into? There was fleas in the house from the dogs. And mm. But I thought it was good because we could do what we wanted. Mm. Um, come in whenever I wanted to get do anything for Hilla. Um, and it was during this time when you were at the house that you became friends with Emma. Yeah. And I say you became friends very loosely because eventually that wasn't what that relationship was no. at all. Um, and it was on this night that you and her, August 2008, um, she, you went back to the takeaway with her. Yeah. And things took a very sinister turn. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know how comfortable you feel talking about this, but if you can, what happened that night? Um, uh, she asked me if I wanted to go to the takeaway shop and I didn't think anything of it because I've been loads of times before and nothing sexual or anything had ever happened. Um, so I went um, and we was there for an hour or so and he, one of the men asked me to go upstairs um, and they started um, asking me uh, about well, basically saying that he wants something in return for the, all the things what he's bought me. Um, and then I said no, but he started being um, like aggressive about it. And mm. then he did what he did. He raped you? <laughs> yeah. And then uh, he came in with a £10 note? Yeah. Um, and he said to me that I, um, I was a special girl and not to cry. Um, and when you went downstairs, um, she was laughing, Emma was laughing. Yeah, she just thought it was funny. She knew that I was, well, I was still crying. She, just she knew it was, was going joke. to, uh, knew it was going to happen though, didn't she? I think so, yeah. I didn't think, know that at the time, but looking back on it all now, yeah. And that's not where it ended, because later on you were driven to a, another flat and you were forced to perform oral sex on another man. Straight after that you were raped by yet another man. And this time it was Emma that came in and gave you the money. Yeah, um, it was straight after. They drove us to another house um, and there was some men there waiting. Um, and I had to have sex with them. Um, and then she, um, one of the men gave her some money um, and she gave me about ten pound out. If, if this story wasn't horrifying enough that you are telling us now, it progressed to extraordinary levels. You were yeah. driven to other properties. You were driven around the north of, of, the, of, of the UK. Um, gangs of men yeah. would be waiting for you. Um, you'd be in your school uniform, yeah. pick you up after school, and then take you to a house where these men would... Yeah. rape you one after the other? They, just didn't, they didn't care really about how old I was. They, well, like they'd pick me up from school um, and just go straight there. Um, and people think it happens at night time. It's, I was going at three o'clock. Were there other girls that you saw either close to you or off in the distance that you thought that this is happening to them as well? Um, yeah, I've seen other girls at houses but didn't I didn't know who they was, I've only seen them. Yeah. Well, you, um, you did eventually speak to the police in August 2008, and one of the, the principal men was arrested, but he was very quickly replaced, as you said, by somebody else. This is in the book. The case was thrown out because there wasn't enough evidence. How did that make you feel? Did you feel that you weren't being listened to, that it wasn't being taken seriously? I just thought there's no point anymore, because if the police aren't even going to do anything. And after that case was thrown out, you 
straight away got caught back up into the same situation, but it escalated and it got worse. And you were, you were being raped up to 20 times a night. Um, there was, it, some, sometimes it would just be a couple of days a week, but other times it would be every night and there could be dozens of men there. And all they, Muslim um, men, these are, these are yeah, all, Asian, all yeah. Asian men. Can I ask you, because obviously emotionally the effect and impact this is going to have on you, but physically as well, 15 years old, being raped repeatedly so many times a week, must have been horrific for you. Yeah, um, I think I sort of got used to it by the, well not used to it, but um, didn't really, didn't upset me anymore. At what point did you decide, or did it happen, that, that you were taken seriously and that things began to move forward? Um, it didn't really, until, um, the policewoman um, got in touch with me a couple of years later when I was 18. Um, was it still going on all of that time? No. no um, it, when was the last time? How old were you when they when it went um, through? 16. Um, I uh, I got pregnant, um, and that's how it all come to an end, really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Although you were still raped a couple of times. Yeah. I whilst was you were pregnant. pregnant when when it stopped so for the first few months it was still going on and they knew that i was pregnant what was it like to finally be listened to to be believed um i just didn't really believe it at first i didn't even while all the investigation was going on i just i didn't think i never thought that they was gonna get i didn't think they'd be found guilty i didn't and i didn't think they'd get the sentences what they've got either i was just, Oh, I don't know. It did uh, go to court. Uh, the police identified a total of 47 victims. In May 2012, nine men were convicted and given sentences of between four and 19 years for offences including sex trafficking, rape and conspiracy to engage in sexual activity with a child. Um, do you think it's still happening? Definitely. Um, I think there's nine men um, was convicted, but there was, they were just the main ones. There was, I met probably hundreds that I could probably walk past them in the street now, and I wouldn't even know it was them, even after they've, what they've done to me. Because sometimes it, it, I'd just see them for the 10 minutes, and I don't know, there's so many, I wouldn't be able to tell you how many. So somewhere, somewhere out there, there's a girl like you, or lots of girls like you, 14, 15, 16 as you were at the time, that this could be happening to, that this, this afternoon they could be picked up from outside school and ra raped a number of times? Yeah, um, I just think, now it's, it, people know about it now and pe they're taking it more serious and I think you'd obviously do need to tell someone because it is wrong and you might think it's great at first but it's not for free and it, it just turns around so quick and I don't speak to someone yeah. talk to someone people listen to you mm -hmm. um, um, we've got a couple of statements I think we should probably read here um, a CPS spokesperson said we acknowledge that the decision in 2009 not to proceed to throw out the case was wrong. Um, the decision was overturned in 2011. We've acknowledged that concerns about Girl A, which is how you were referred to, her credibility as a witness were a factor in the original decision and that our conclusion on this issue was wrong. There's been a fundamental shift in the way we now approach these cases and the Greater Manchester Police say we want to make it clear that it's not acceptable for any police officer to appear disinterested in a victim who is confiding in them about what has happened. We'd like to reassure anyone coming forward that they'll be treated sensitively, compassionately and with respect. We've significantly improved our service and support for victims. And this is your story here in the book, Girl A, My Story, The Truth About the Rochdale Sex Ring by the Victim Who Stopped Them.
They were groomed by men who targeted vulnerable girls. But these victims, some as young as 10, were written off by the very authorities that were supposed to protect them. That's the verdict of a report which outlines years of failings by police and social services in Rochdale. It was ordered after nine members of a child sex abuse ring were jailed in May. Our social affairs editor, Jackie Long, has spoken to the family of one young girl who says she was passed around like a piece of meat, but that nobody gave a toss. On the streets in towns across the northwest, children were being raped and brutally sexually assaulted by a string of men. And in the offices of the services supposed to be protecting those children, precious little was being done to stop it. She was being raped on a regular basis. Um, she was being held um, in rooms where there was um, men coming in one after the other to abuse her. The thought of such a young child and I say child because that's what she was. Um, her child has been taken away from her. Marie's daughter Sarah was just 12 when she was befriended by the young men who would eventually be the first of many to sexually exploit her. As she went missing for days on end, Marie realized she was in danger and begged the authorities for help. I went for child protection in my area. Um, I never got one phone call back. The school were well aware of it. I'd gone to the police in the area where I lived. Um, very little was being done. Um, it was as though it was all just brushed under the carpet. I don't think services knew what to do um, because it was of um, an ethnic nature. And by that, I mean these, the pe perpetrators that were doing this to my daughter were of an Asian background. And I think for race relations, they didn't want it to be aired. Unable to protect her child from the men, she voluntarily put Sarah into care. To force the hands of social services to do something, and that's what we had to do. But she wasn't looked after in care? This, no. this didn't stop when she was in care? No. If anything, it got worse. Um, the men were waiting outside in cars. Um, she was being asked to take over girls. Yet the police would, um, at one point, said they could prosecute my daughter for coercion. Yet she wasn't able... Um, to break free from these people. This went on for us for five years. And it's only now my daughter's recognising that it wasn't her fault. Much of the abuse happened here in Hayward. The report says it was known as far back as 2007 that around 50 children were being sexually exploited, some as young as 10. I spoke to one of the victims who didn't want to appear on camera. But when I asked her why she thought nothing had been done to stop it, she told me... No one cared about us, not the men, but no one else either. It was the trial of these men in May, convicted of a raft of sex offences against children, which exposed the failings of so many agencies and prompted today's review. It concluded that too often the girls had simply not been listened to, or that care workers judged that they knew what they were doing. Indeed, some had chosen to do it. I think the biggest failing has been the way that um, organisations shared information, individuals shared information, so a lot of the young people, um, at account of what was happening to them, wasn't uh, put together uh, with other young people who were making similar allegations. But isn't it not just about whether that information was shared, it was people's analysis of that information, wasn't it? It was about these girls coming and saying, I'm being sexually exploited. And people either not believing them, people who are supposed to care for them, not believing them, or suggesting that somehow it was consensual sex, yet yeah, these were children. And, and the report's very clear about that and those failings of um, organisations, individuals in those organisations, and it's really disappointing. And, you know, I'm, a, I'm as uh, shocked and uh, appalled as anybody reading the report would be. Marie, once so desperate for help, she took this banner and staged a protest in the streets, is now joining other families considering legal action against the authorities. We've lost everything, um, not just our home life. Um, this is going to take us years to overcome. And in, in many cases, she may never, ever come out of this. But you still have to support her and be there for her, to put your arms around and still love her, even though you know what these men have done. The council's failures have been many. They've accepted that. But they denied today that race was ever a factor, a denial that will fail to satisfy many critics. 
They have accepted, though, that their appalling refusal to listen to what children were telling them left children in the hands of brutal abusers. It is still going on. Grooming, rape and sex abuse in Rochdale and beyond. Today's report merely deals with the recent past. Six children raped and exploited by a gang of men for five years. Yet 17 different agencies, including the police and social services, failed completely to give them sufficient help. Today's report says much of it could have been prevented. The review was prompted by the conviction of nine men last year, but police now admit that up to 30 other suspects were never prosecuted at all. This report by Cordelia Lynch begins with the testimony of one victim, voiced by an actor. I was 13 years old and passed between them like a ball. I suffered rape and threats of violence. What made things worse for me was the attitude of the police. I told them about what was happening. I gave them names, phone numbers and car registrations. I told them about a man who made threats to kill me. The men were not arrested and I still sometimes see them walking the streets of Rochdale. This terrifies me. She continues to suffer, one of the many victims of a grooming gang in Rochdale that was allowed to thrive by a police force that failed to listen or act. Last year, nine men, mostly of Pakistani origin, were convicted of abusing the vulnerable girls, plying them with alcohol and cigarettes. But there are many more who were reported by the girls and their families, but were not investigated. Much of the abuse happened here in Hayward. And now more than 18 months down the line, we have two reports into two separate cases with one central question. How could it be that young, vulnerable girls could report years of systematic sexual abuse and yet the agencies who were meant to be protecting them failed to stop it? 17, including NHS trusts and social services, missed countless opportunities. Some of the girls were as young as 12, but officers from Greater Manchester Police suggested their decision to be with the men, some in their 50s, was a lifestyle choice. And when one girl fell pregnant, they obtained the aborted fetus for evidence without her permission. It was only years later, when they gained my trust under false pretenses, that they told me they had kept the fetus and wanted to use it in evidence. Sir Peter Fahey was chief constable in 2008. Today's report states his detectives were untrained and failed to report allegations of rape as crimes. When you read through the way that those officers behaved in this case, are you ashamed? No, I'm not. I'm not ashamed because um, I think it is very easy to blame individual police officers. I've got a lot of sympathy for officers that are working with the system. I remember in those days going to Rochdale CID, sitting next to police officers who absolutely believed their victim, um, but had, had found inconsistencies in the story, had found that the, you know, the victim had previous convictions, drug issues, alcohol issues, and already knew that when they put the case through to the Crown Prosecution Service or tried to get it into court, that the case would not be taken forward. But today the force is criticised for failing to challenge that decision by the Crown Prosecution Service not to prosecute. Prior to this case, a view was taken that a case couldn't be built on the credibility of a young girl who had a troubled or a chaotic background. We took the decision in 2011 to bring this prosecution, uh, to successfully prosecute it, and therefore why can't it be done everywhere? This case review reads like so many others before it, a woeful tale of miscommunication, agencies failing to talk to each other and critically to listen to the victims and their families. In one case, a father was so concerned he called social services and the police 50 times, only to be told by one social worker that his daughter was a child prostitute. I've got files like that. Maggie Oliver worked on the case but resigned last year over the way police treated victims. She spoke exclusively to Channel 4 News. When I read a report that focuses on 2008 and I'm told that we've learnt lessons from this and things are so much better now, well I have got evidence to say that in 2011 things were no better in 2012. Who do you think should be held accountable? I guess the Chief Constable. My audit trail went right through to the Chief Constable. I documented in writing all my concerns and I backed up what I was saying with uh, documentary evidence. Jonathan Bridge is the lawyer for three of the victims. I think even in the Rochdale case, you will be looking at hundreds potentially still out there preying on victims. 
One of my clients who was abused in Rochdale also reports abuse in seven or eight other towns across the northwest and even down as far as, as Wolverhampton in the Midlands. And this was a, a feature of this type of abuse that not only were the girls abused in a specific town, but they would be passed between gangs in other towns. And unfortunately, I think Rochdale is just the tip of an iceberg. The Independent Police Complaints Commission are due to publish a report into Rochdale, but the girls, now troubled young women, have already lost all faith in the force. The abuse I suffered at the hands of the gang has made a massive impact on my life, but it's been made so much worse by the police. I feel so let down by them and feel what has happened to me could have been prevented had they acted more quickly. Well, former Detective Maggie Oliver joins us now. Good morning, Maggie. It's lovely to see you. Well, Thank you for joining us today. Um, for us, for those of us who were so stunned and shocked by what we saw on the news and read in the papers, we thought when those guys went to prison that that might be the end of the story, that there was a little bit of closure for the country. Uh, it would appear, certainly looking at your book and listening to you speak, that that is very far from what you believe to be the truth. Very much. Um, I would say it's the, it is the tip of the iceberg. Um, you know, I've done a lot of talking about this issue, but I think that we are still only starting to understand the real magnitude of what has been happening over the past 25, 30 years. Mm. Um, we've still got a long way to go. Mm. Uh, it does, it does seem extraordinary, doesn't it? Because, I mean, we say on here, you know, so many times now, if ever, if ever there's a time for you to have a voice, if you've experienced abuse of any sort, now is the time to have a voice. Go to the police, you will be heard, this is your time. It seems extraordinary that we're having this conversation now. Yeah, I mean, I, I was a police officer, you know, for 16 years, and I joined the police to put the good, the bad, guys away yeah. and I felt it was very simple perhaps naively you have kids who are telling you what's gone on so you have the evidence the job of the police is then to put that evidence to the CPS yeah. and the courts but what I saw over actually a period of from 2003 until I resigned in 2012 I saw the polar opposite of that in what was happening on the grooming cases um, and I didn't even know this particular kind of crime existed until 2003 mm -hmm. but um, the government and the politicians knew full well about it in the mid-90s because Anne Cryer was the MP for Keithley in West Yorkshire and she was banging on doors in, in the, in the mid-90s. So why? Why are doors being slammed in your face when you're trying to open them and shout loudly? I don't understand. I, I don't think... I mean, it's very difficult in five minutes to explain the full, um, yeah, the full reason well, for it's that. All, it's, all it's all in the book and I, I've tried to make it very clear as to what I think. But I think that this, it's not a one-word answer. I think there's a lot of reasons why um, the politicians and the chief constables turned a blind eye mm. to this kind of crime. Um, one of the reasons is that these kids are very vulnerable. Um, and I think it's more than just ethnicity. I think it's attitudes of, of them and us we, attitude we, of an we, underclass. We've got to be very thing. careful. I mean, obviously, we're, we're terribly careful how we word things on yeah. here. You know, one slip up and you're really in trouble if you get the wording of something wrong. Yeah. And that seems to be almost what was the concern within the, within the force there, that it was, a, it was almost a, a PC thing. They were terrified of looking racist. Because what we haven't said so far is that these guys convicted <laughs> were either Pakistani or of a, a wider Asian culture. And so, the, and, and you say that that could be happening elsewhere in the country. It was certainly happening a lot more in Rochdale than was brought to light or that anyone was yeah. ever prosecuted for. But this is the Asian community on the local community. I mean, they were locals, at, of course, at the time and, and still are. And, and you would like to think everyone embedded within the same community. Well, I, I don't think it's just me saying it anymore. When I first spoke out, it was just me. But now... Um, we only have to look around the country. You know, there's been trials in lots of places now. Um, you know, not just Rochdale, but Rotherham. You know, Baroness Jay uh, spoke very openly about what was going on in Rotherham. So it is no longer a secret. Nazir Afsal, who was the CPS Crown Prosecutor, I think in um, two years ago, he, 
he made it public that the government had sent an email round to all police forces throughout the country not to um, deal with this particular kind of crime. Now, the, you know, the question is, why? Yes. And I don't think it is just ethnicity. I think that is part of the issue. Um, and on o Operation Augusta, for certain, I know now, and I didn't know this then... This was in Manchester, so this was earlier than Rochdale. This was in the, 2003. Yes, it was. Mm. Um, but a, a young... A girl, a little girl called Victoria Goglia, had died in Rochdale. She'd been groomed and exploited by a gang of predatory paedophiles. Um, nobody was prosecuted for that, but we started Operation Augusta as a result of that death, looking at whether we had a similar situation in the city centre of Manchester, and we did. But we had a major investigation looking into that. And, you know, listeners can make up their own decisions, but the last entry on the um, database that, that we had in Greater Manchester Police went on that database on the night of the 6th of July 2005. On the morning of the 7th, we had the, the London bombing. Now, that right. is a fact. I'm not... I'm just stating the facts. Mm -hmm. It's up to the reader to make up their own assessment. Do you, do you believe, and you say that, that, that you, you felt that you, you know, you're battering your head against a brick wall, that you weren't being listened to, you weren't being helped from within the force, um, constant barriers being thrown up, eventually leading you to resign. Yeah. Do you believe that this is still happening now? I know it's still happening because I am in regular contact, even as recently as Sunday. I was in Rochdale. I, I have got my finger on the pulse of what's going on in Rochdale. I know, um, you know, even a few weeks ago, one of the girls that I deal with bumped into one of her abusers in Rochdale um, and he actually spat in her face. Mm. That is not ten years ago. That is three weeks ago. So, you know, I... I, f I sound a little bit like a broken record to oh, myself. But you are. But I'm trying I mean, to you move... Just, yeah. You just want to keep shouting it from the rooftops because it must be so frustrating. And uh, yeah. Because... For somebody who got into the police in the first time, like you started this conversation, saying to yeah. lock up the bad guys, yeah. what does that do to you personally? I mean, the, 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 you've lost a job which you strongly believed in. At I, the I loved my job, you know? It almost destroyed me. And I think what... I mean, what I hope my book... Um, explains is what I am like as a person and I am not a bitter and twisted person who wanted to make a fuss. I saw something that was happening. Um, I've got four kids of my own and what I saw happening to these kids was just wrong mm. and if I had, I tried, I didn't want to resign. I was 15 months still within the job when I saw for the second time, a job being shelved. And I spent 15 months going to everybody, from chief superintendents to the chief constable to the Home Office, the IPCC, and nobody wanted to do anything. And then you, you face with a stark reality, a, a choice. You either speak out or you carry on and do nothing. And, and I couldn't look myself in the mirror knowing what was going on. Um, I wanted my conscience clear and 30 years down the road when my kids find out that I didn't speak up, mm. um, I wanted them to know that I'd tried. Yeah, yeah. I tried. But I didn't know it would go this far, Holly. Well, yeah. um, well done, you. the Greater Manchester Police have said to us, uh, following uh, learning taken from Operation Span, Greater Manchester has worked tirelessly to improve its response to tackling CSE, that's child sexual exploitation, to ensure high standards of service and consistency in practices across Greater Manchester. <laughs> Um, we're seeking, constantly seeking ways to, in which to evolve and improve our practices. Um, thank you very much indeed for coming in. This is, this is the, the story, this is what we're talking about, Maggie's books, um, Fighting for Justice Survivors. Um, and, uh, and as I say, it's a very complicated story, but it's, uh, it Can is I all I just in say there. very quickly that um, I've started my own, the Maggie Oliver Foundation. Yeah. I'm going to start a centre in Rochdale to help survivors, not just of grooming, but from all communities, whether it's a forced marriage or um, female genital mutilation. I want a place for them yeah. to go to feel supported with access to, you know, professional, yeah. psychological, legal um, mentoring Not help. Good for you. So Thank please you. support. Yeah. Maggie, do you believe there are men still walking freely in Rochdale? I know Who there should are. be behind bars that were part of this Rochdale sex ring? They, they are walking freely currently today. I mean, well, uh, there are things that come out in tonight's episode, but, for instance, Amber spent six months doing video interviews yeah. as a victim as a witness, naming 20, 30 men. That raped her. And it took her an awful lot to put a trust us, because she'd already been arrested 
at the age of 15. So that the little bit of the interview that's shown in the drama was actually perhaps a 10, 15 minute part of hours and hours of interviews. That is the only time that she was, it was her first interview and she was testing the water. Yeah. Um, but of all the allegations that she made, all the men that she named, there is not one record of those allegations. Nothing was crime. Oh I just God. can't believe it. I can't believe it. I can't this believe happened it to a couple this of years day. ago. Not one of those allegations was crimed. Not one of those men was arrested and interviewed in relation to the abuse of her. And they had the addresses. And they had the. She did a oh. list of numbers yeah. with Ruby. Ruby was being abused by that man at the age of 12, actually. Oh, my God. You know, he got her pregnant when she was just 13. Oh. And even that man, we had a fetus that she didn't know the police had seized. That, that was what I was, one of the things I was tasked to do, to go and tell Lorna, Lorna yeah. and, um, and Ruby. But that was your brilliance because you might, and that's why I, we've, we formed our lovely friendship, because there's a difference between being a copper and there's a, there's a difference between someone who you can trust. And mm -hmm. I don't know what you have within you mm -hmm. to get those girls to be able to open up. And I know we're indebted mm -hmm. to you for, yeah. for letting that happen. <laughs> What I would say, yeah, it is, it's, it's about being human and caring. Now, um, but there are a lot of police officers with those skills. It's just that the, the powers that be do not allow them to, um, to put the time in and the effort. And, you know, they're, they're looking at a, a quick hit and move on. Mm. And is it convenient? We need radical changes. And that isn't just the police, that's the CPS, because the CPS overturned... Uh, the decision to drop Holly in 2009. And apologised for it. Yes, but they actually repeated that same mistake, in my opinion, with Amber, because yeah. they put her through months of interviews and then changed the mind. And more than that, they then added her onto the indictment as one of the group of paedophiles mm -hmm. without arresting her, without cautioning her, without interviewing her, without giving her access to legal advice or a solicitor, without telling her what was being said in court. And then, I'm sorry, but and then we're trying to take her children off her because she'd been named as a paedophile. Yeah. And to me, I can't get my head around it to this day. Maggie, I have to ask you, I mean, some have alleged um, an eagerness not to appear racist um, meant that I'm police and social... Oh, no, absolutely not, but meant that um, police and social services were unwilling to almost deal with this. Do you feel that was an issue in those early days? All I will say is that the law is the law. And if a man, whoever that is, whether it's Jimmy Savile or whether it's the Catholic Church or whether... If a man of 40, 50, 60 is Many picking schoolgirls up from school and having sex with a 12, 13, 14-year-old yeah. girl. Yeah. He is a paedophile. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And, yeah. Um, and, and I don't know why senior police officers needed convincing of that. Mm -hmm. They are the people who make the decisions. Um, and I was told before I resigned, what was said to me was, you know what? Senior police officers make decisions, and if you can't accept those decisions, then maybe you're in the wrong job. Mm. And that's what made me resign, because I felt that this had to come out into the public arena to bring about changes. And I also believe that senior police officers should be held accountable for failing yeah. to act. Mm -hmm. Knowingly, and uh, the other part of it was I was looking at Hillsborough and 30 years of trauma for all those families that mm -hmm. people make mistakes. Of course. And I, I know that, but you hold your hands up and you acknowledge your mistakes and then you can start to put them right. They still don't acknowledge those mistakes. When you were right in the thick of everything, yeah. there must have been moments where you felt not only not heard, because that's been categorical, um, but you must have felt that you were going mad. Oh, yeah, no, that's absolutely, that's that's the exact phrase. Yeah, really thought that I was the wrong one. Um, and, that uh, yeah, uh, I was going mad. Well, I did go mad. I mean, that's a technical term. I did, you know, uh, really kind of... My mental health really did suffer. Mm. Um, because, actually, you just fa I was just faced with an incredibly high wall that was yeah. I, I couldn't get over. Um, and lots of people were not seeing the things that I saw. Um, and not acting when you were doing the correct thing and making calls and taking notes and giving evidence. Yeah. Nothing was being done. That's right. And it, it was quite an isolating position as well yeah. to be in. 
So do you feel, before the case, obviously we said they're a decade, but obviously I know because of three girls and, and, and it's been heavily documented in the press, but the warning signs, were they there about sexual grooming? Did you, had you had that experience in your job before this case? Uh, is, I, I don't think that um, sexual exploitation in Rochdale happened just simply because we were there. It was almost kind of given a name, almost even after the court case. Mm. I absolutely believe that there were uh, scores of young people before our team existed who were being abused in exactly the same way. Mm, yeah. Absolutely. What's happened as a result of your struggle to get justice for these girls is that you uncovered something that was happening all over the country. Yeah, that's true. And that what what it seems to me is so shocking is that what has ha what happened in Rochdale that culminated <laughs> after a decade of your life and eventually a, a long trial and the girls not being believed and then being believed and you, uh, you know, taking so much flack for it. Then we discover all over the country in city centres, this is still going on. That's right. And I, I kind of think if it's not happening in your town, then you're not looking hard enough. I looked at, at the streets and I looked around takeaways and I looked at streets I'd walked past before with fresh eyes. And that happened to me years ago when I made a film about very young people becoming prostitutes. And then I suddenly couldn't walk through the West End of London yeah. without seeing them. Yes. And, of course, once you start to look, you start to see it happening. Yeah. But do you think that's an argument, like we were talking earlier today, that in the Baltic countries, for example, they have sex education very early on. Yeah. Do you think that that's sh what should happen here, that, that, that children at primary school should be told stuff? Absolutely, and I, and I kind of think we don't... You know, there's, there are elements of all of that which actually the emphasis should be about what's the positive relationship, what yeah. does trust yeah. mean? What does love what, mean? How do you work, love. What does true love mean? How do you work out what a real friend is? Mm. Um, but equally, we have to balance that with if anything doesn't feel OK, if there's a small bit of uncomfortableness, yeah. where do you go then? Who it's so interesting. To I had this conversation help? with my daughter last night. She's 11 and um, she's going through something at school. It's nothing to do with, with, with this. But in terms of what I was saying to her was that if, if somebody is making you feel uncomfortable and you're not saying anything about it because you don't want them to feel bad, you're putting how they feel ahead of how you feel. Yeah. No one is more important than you. You should be able to speak up. And when, you know, you were working as a sexual health worker mm -hmm. and you have 13-year-old girls coming in mm -hmm. asking for the morning after pill or to, to, could you help them get an abortion, a lot of that comes down to not wanting to speak out and not wanting to, to say, actually, this is making me feel a, a, a certain way. So yeah. it's, it's educating girls and letting them, giving them the power to, to stand up and That's say, right. actually, no, I don't like this. Yeah. And, and part of our, something I feel was a real success from the team was that those girls brought their friends who brought yeah. their friends and that was real validation. Yeah. And I also kind of think there's an awful lot of mothers who've approached us over that period to say how grateful they were that we were there in the first place. But it was a very dark time and, and I know that because of the scripts yeah. and stuff, but who was there for you, Sarah, when you went home? How, how, it was a very dark time for you, wasn't it? And that's what worries me. How did you deal with that? Um, I know it's this. Uh, you see, my mum died just before the drama was shown. My mum was like everybody's. Your mum's usually your rock, mm -hmm. um, and my mum was my rock. Um, How are you going to go forward now? I mean, do you feel that you can? You look astonishingly. You still live in the same area. I still live in the same area. Yeah. 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 Well, it's and where I was born and brought up.
Okay guys, how you doing? Red Pill Phil here with Bill F from PAG UK. We're getting the most of this beautiful sunshine today here in Rochdale, so we, yeah, we've decided to go to an outdoor location to film this, which is going to be, as promised, a Q&A session that Bill is going to try and answer all these questions as honestly and as openly as possible. And there's uh, no questions that are going to catch you out here, mate. It's just questions that have been laid out through the comments section. Oh, we're up nice and early, me, Phil. Oh, he's ready for it. <laughs> the early bird gets away. It's like five days late, so I've had plenty of time yeah. to think about it. Right, you see, you've probably had a look at them all anyway. He's got I'll an idea. i some, but I don't mind answering them again for everybody else. Okie dokie. Right then. Let's start with the moderator. My moderator on my channel, Great Brit. I know there was talk of selling things to a wider audience from the shop on places like eBay. Did that ever happen? We gave it a go. We opened a PAG UK sales group. However, boots on the ground, timing, case loads, it's just not been viable. Um, it's something we want to do, but we need, we need some more help with boots on the ground. Because these are all great initiatives, yeah. but it's having the people in place That's to do it. it. See, at the moment, um, it's a case of, I've got my fundraiser, I've got my support team, I've got my treasurer, I've got my secretary, and they're all the same people, you know, so... You can't diversify too much when you haven't got the, the bodies there That's to it. deal you with know, it, you otherwise only, you get nothing done to a degree, I guess. You don't get me wrong, I'd love millions of pounds in the bank so I could designate all these jobs that I've got yeah. that I don't need doing. And it'd be a, an efficient machine. Of course, yeah. It's, so, it in a so sense, answering different. this question, you'd almost see, not your flaws, but where you could improve, but at the same time, you can only work with what you've got, I guess, That's as well. It, yeah, yeah just, you answered it better than I could, though, I mean, like, <laughs> you know, you know give what you've got, you know, you yeah. can't give what you haven't got. You know, yeah, so. and you're trying, mate. Yeah, yeah, so there you go, there, great, you know, great. Rochdale looks I, I, you know me, I want it everywhere, you know. So. Yeah, and people on here know that, mate. Me, Honestly, know, you'll get, I'll get to some of these questions and they'll be putting you on guilt trips even oh, more, mate, no, if he I hasn't. Know, know. As soon as they hear another area, I think, <laughs> why, why are we not there already? <laughs> no. Clears on and that's good. what these guys think as soon as they're watching it, because they know it's an initiative that's working. But let's carry on, mate. Gordon Roofden. He's put, are they speaking to any MPs, and if so, how proactive are they? So, well, where do I start? The first person, the first MP I went to see was Tony Lloyd of Rochdale. Tony Lloyd was a former police and crime commissioner for Greater Manchester, lost out in the mayor run against Andy Burnham, and parachuted in here as Rochdale's MP. Let's just stop the Tony Lloyd oversaw Rochdale's grooming scandal. Anywhere else in Greater Manchester that got hit with a scandal, Tony Lloyd was Chief Bob. Um, so I think he's part of the cover up of what happened here in Rochdale. So then he ends up as RMP, so I'll go to see him. And the first thing I ask him about is Norview and Cambridge House. Mm -hmm. Then I address his the grooming, and the same answer to each of the questions was the past is in the past. Well, that's the worst thing you can say to a survivor. Sure, it is. Um, There's no acknowledgement there. The worst survivor to say that to was me. <laughs> so, you know. Yeah. Uh, and that's been their stance ever since? Ever since. No, no, we never got a second showing because because how it was told in that first meeting, mm. you're out of order, you're wrong on this, you need to go away, you need to do your own work, you need to do your research, you need to come back and meet me again, and we need to discuss it again. When I went back for the second appointment, we was told, I'm no point having an appointment with you because the first one wasn't constructive at all. So therefore, I don't see no need for a second appointment. Wow. Nice. So nice. That's mm, the one and only MP so from when Rochdale you, that I spoke to. When you know that you're one of the major organisations in Rochdale that's primarily looking at survivors and empowering survivors, for him to disregard you in that way and say that you're not really worthy of a second meeting, what does that say to all the survivors, Billy? what they've been told for 50 years already, isn't it? It's the same thing, it's the same old boys club mentality of no soon shut up, no soon shut up, yeah. no soon shut up. Um, yeah. Smith did it, Farnell did it, and then Alan yeah. Brett's doing it and Tony Lloyd's doing it. The know? system in place, how the mechanisms that they have used are far more greater and powerful and got more longevity than you, Billy. That's what they're trying to say, than your individual will. There you go, you see. There you go. Is that the case, though, in reality, yeah, when people are waking up? severely underestimating me, though, Phil. Um, Indeed. Severely, yeah, of course, yeah. So, um, to answer your question, then, they're not proactive? They're, um, 
facilitated. Uh, the proactive in facilitation, in mm. uh, knowingly doing nothing while children are still to this day being abused. Mm. Same people, different case, you know what I sure. mean? Sad, so. sad days, well you won't be here if there There's was no that need proactive. for me to be here, you know. Like, a lot of people think, oh you know, I'm enjoying this, I'm you know, getting a kick out of being popular. And, uh, I don't want to get up every day thinking about child abuse. There's better ways of being popular. Play a guitar. You know, the, I that's something that I, I argue myself with because of how, when I get a case now, how I'm not falling to pieces. I did at first in the early days, but now I'm not falling to pieces. Uh, and I kick myself for that, saying, I'm normalising it in my head. Do you know what I mean? Um, but it's not the case, guys. You, every case is a turmoil to every member of my team. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah. No, he's not proactive, he's useless. Right, the next question is by Stephanie Parker. What kept his motivation when I feel sure the whole of the system was against him? Also, how do I donate? All oh, right, that's wonderful. Um, first, what for the fire in the belly? Um, it's easy one to answer, but it's hard if you know what I mean. Um, I'm a survivor of abuse myself. Um, so there's where the fire starts, but that's not what feeds the fire. What feeds the fire is the success we've had. And when I say success is, since April, there's been 29.5 years of prison sentence handed out to people. Um, that feeds the fire. What else feeds the fire is people coming into the PAG UK, asking for help, speaking to us. That feeds the fire. And the amount of success we've had with helping people change people's lives. I've had a young girl there last night said, saved their life, saved my life, this life, these, like these guys, this, this place has saved my life and I've heard her say it once or twice now and a lot of people just see it as a off the cuff remark but mm. actually no, we, we believe them, we saved their life, mm. do you know what I mean, because of where she was at the time, mm. where she is now. If you can save someone from violation, sexual violation mate, you have saved a hell of a lot of trauma. If you yeah, can be yeah. pre preventative, or even if that has happened and you can be there to be an arm that reaches around yeah. them and help them. I mean, that's, that's probably the main thing we do, um, is Africa. Um, but we're massive on prevention, and there's not many groups like ours that are big on prevention. Um, to the point where we're out on the streets every night. Mm. Um, yeah, there's not enough of us to do that. Well, that's going back to the first question. Yeah, of course, you know, I'd love to be able to... Walk into a building at six o'clock and have ten guys to say, right, there's four teams of three, you know what I mean? Or just, you know, bad maths that, but you know what I mean? Mm. You know? And then, oh, it'd be so much different, we'd be able to cut it in, in half even, you know, mm. I reckon. We have done that in Rochdale, I've been told unofficially, what PAG UK is doing is cut in terms of offences in half. This is another question by No More. Are there any plans in place to have a PAG UK centre in all major cities, towns across the country? One of our desires is to roll this model out right around the country in places where it's needed. So this brings us, uh, we have tried it already in Accrington. Um, unfortunately, it's been a complete block by Highburn Council. Um, the set goals we cannot meet. Um, the sales on the place aren't doing too well, so it's not covering the rent. So we've had to make the tough decision, heartbreaking decision, because CJ and Jack, you work on Acton, work so hard, I've had to pull the plug on Accrington, so it's no longer going to be. However, I don't want the people of Accrington who watch this thinking, oh, what about us? Because I promise you now, I pledge, we have not forgot you, we're not going to leave you. We're going to run surgeries from our tea rooms in the centre, so we'll be doing a couple of weeks, maybe, or a couple of months. You know, but we will be active in Accrington. We're not leaving you, we're not giving up on you. We're just because of your council, we've had to scale it back from having a walking centre. However, that might return one day. Um, mm. But at this point in time, it's just going to be down to surgeries and contact via Facebook. Anyone from Accrington with any issues, feel free to get in touch. Um, See, this is a frustration with a whole lot of subbies of mine. They, they feel that what you're doing is so efficient and so professional they, they want you where they live. Yeah, yeah. That, that is all they're really saying. Now, yeah. that to me is the best compliment 
anyone of could course, give you of course. when are you coming to us Billy why yeah. aren't you coming to us I know you must be thinking for fuck's sake I can't do it all guys because yeah. you can't no, you're, you're struggling in Rochdale it's frustrating because I want to I really really want yeah, to yeah. be able to go to all these other but going back to land. the first question again yeah, resources money people money. you can trust that are going to do it we're actually in the process of setting up uh, application to become a registered charity now let me explain to those people who are watching and saying well why is it not a charity already I've been I've had the shop for 12 months Pag UK is 8 years old well, bit you know, 7, 6, 7 years old you know the reason why is I don't trust the system I will not for the sake of having a cash injection not be silent if you get what I mean so if we take the funding that comes by Rochdale Council. That's only going to come if we stop talking about Rochdale Council in a bad way, which is what I've always mm. done. Um, I've exposed and exposed and exposed to no effect yet, but I've still keep exposed and exposed. And the only joy we've had is Richard Barnell jumping, jumping the ship, you know. But if I'd have took 10 grand off them to run Pag UK, I'd have had to stop all that. Yeah, there's so, an element. It's, I know. it's like a little bit of buy-off money to a degree it yeah. can be. Tony Lloyd was yeah. MP for uh, Tony Lloyd was crime commissioner for but he's Rochdale boy he was Peter Fahey. When Peter Fahey was moved on, he was moved on to the charity commission. So therefore I wasn't gonna go and ask him for money. I wasn't gonna go and it's me own it's my, it's my feelings towards them and I I've realised I've had a bit of a think, I've had a bit of a talk, we've decided that we're gonna go a different way and I'm gonna let them to go. it's against everything I believe, I, you know, but I, it's the only way we can be able to be more effective and I can get if I can get funding for this I can get out there and get somewhere else. And that's the only reason why I've kind of bit my own tongue with it. I yeah. don't want to, I don't want to ask No, but I know what you're saying, by doing what you're doing, at least if it's on your own, albeit harder. It's integral and it's solid and you know exactly where you stand. Once you start taking outside influences in terms of finances, it can take a little bit of that integrity away and you don't want to lose grip of it. I know, well, on I know the other exactly plus hand, we're losing out 100 grand a year and that 100 grand can sure. go towards so much making a difference, not just here in Rochdale, but yeah. Oldham, Bury, Airwood. We've got plans, uh, the next stop, I don't want to name the place we want to go next, but it's quite close to us because we've been working there already for so long, so the due diligence has already been done, it's just setting up there. But there is places like Oldham, Bury, Stockport, you know, other places where we really want to go, we mm -hmm. really want to turn up, you know what I mean? But mm -hmm. until I get there, it's, and it's not just asking anybody to come forward and give us an hand, it have to be the right fit. You know what I mean? So, sure. And we've got to be a fussy. Yeah. It's, it's got to be done right. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, sometimes, for the sake of doing it, it could actually be detrimental and non productive. Well, so. I've made that mistake. I'm learning by my own mistakes because mm. I've let people in. I'll trust anybody um, at first glance. You know what I mean? I'll give anyone a fair crack of the whip. Mm. Um, and it's come back to bite me on the arse a few times. So now I've had to take recruiting route volunteers off me, off my, because I'm too gay. And I've had to put someone a little bit more strict on, on the case, you know what yeah. I mean? And he's very good at it, you know what I mean? So yeah. I have to learn. Uh, he's, I'm having to say, well, hang on a minute, it's a bit, you know, I've had to just say, it's all yours. You know what I mean? So that's the way that's got to be. So in answer to the question, is it a case of watch this space then? Not if, new... when. Yeah. Not if, when. You've got to go fund me, is that still going? Yeah, go fund me, up. Right, yeah. okay, uh, so in the description yeah. of this video, I'll put I did put, put in... the PayPal link in the description. Right, okay, uh, well, I'll just copy so and paste that and put I'm it in sure this next I'm not sure if anything's video. gone in and out like Right, well, there you go, you see. The guy's not waiting around for money, he's just... Uh, just yeah, getting yeah, on with the work. got to get on with it. Get on with it. got to get on with it. Right, mate, this is a uh, first, uh, last view. <laughs> I have no idea what that is all about but it's more of a statement i would like you to tell billy he has my full support even though it's just my best wishes and admiration due to my personal circumstances he is a hero and a fine example of a man something we seem to have lost in this country as we seem to grow perpetual children i would like to invite those watching this to thumbs up this comment to show the numbers who are in the same place as i am and admire his work Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. That's kind, kind words. Uh, but I'm no hero. I support at least four heroes a day. 
with support and Africa, but I ain't no hero. Um, they're to me, them, they're to my heroes, them who come forward and speak and speak out, they're my heroes. I'm no hero, I'm just a voice. You know well, I mean? people sort of have you in that high regard, mate, and for the work that you do, like this man has said, not everyone can do that. And I so class when every see... one of my team are heroes as well. Well, of course, know. everyone who's doing the fight in whatever angle is in some ways a hero. <laughs>